welcome to part 2 of the lecture on uh, global register allocation. So, in the last part, part 1 of the lecture, I told you about the issues in global register allocation. So, which register to use, where to you know uh, place, which variables to place in the registers etcetera etcetera. And uh, I also meant you know told you about uh, the problem as such. So, let us uh, begin with the problem definition. So, global register allocation assumes that allocation is done beyond basic blocks and usually at the function level. The implication is that we are not actually limited to just basic blocks in the program to do register allocation, but uh, we can also do it at the higher level namely the function or maybe a group of uh, loops etcetera etcetera. So, these uh, you know this, uh, this sort of global register allocation actually becomes uh, much better than a local register allocation, because it saves a lot of uh, uh, stores and loads at the boundary of the basic blocks. There is a very important decision problem related to register allocation. So, the problem is uh, in the slide, typically it says uh, uh, you know uh, we are given uh, a number k and uh, we are going to represent the program in the form of a control flow graph that is the assumption. And then uh, depending on the number of variables in the program, is there an assignment of registers to program variables such that no conflicting variables are assigned the same register. So, the uh, requirement is if there are two uh, variables and uh, if they actually uh, carry values at the same time in the program, then they are said to be conflicting variables. I will give you a proper definition of this a little later. So, if the register if the variables conflict then they cannot be assigned the same register. The other thing is uh, we should not introduce unnecessary loads and stores and uh, we must use at most k registers for the program. So, this problem has been shown to be NP complete way back in 1970 by Ravi Sethi. Therefore, the heuristic way of solving the problem is the only way ahead. Graph coloring is one of the most important popu and popular heuristics that is used and that is the one we are going to discuss as well. There are simpler algorithms, so we will look at uh, one of them possibly for the loops. So, let us see what conflicting variables are. So, two variables interfere or conflict if their live ranges intersect. So, that brings us to another uh, terminology called the live range. So, a variable is live at a point p of the flow graph, if there is a use of that variable in the path from p to the end of the flow graph that is what this definition says. So, let us look at uh, an example to understand it. So, here is the flow graph. So, we have defined the variable a here and the variable b here. There is a usage of this variable a here and the usage of this variable b here. So, at this point definitely we can say yes there is a usage of the variable a. So, and similarly at this point we can say that there is a usage of the variable b as well. So, this is what we mean by uh, you know usage of a variable. So, from here onwards the live range of a starts from its definition and it. Uh, so, b 2 then uh, at b 4 also we can answer the question of uh, usage is there a usage of the variable a yes. So, this block this block and uh, and this block constitute the live range of the variable a. Similarly, b 3 b 4 and b 6 constitute the live range of the variable b. So, very strictly speaking we actually have to look at the program points. So, typically instruction number in the basic block and the basic block number. 
So, the, pro, uh, the range live range of a variable is the smallest set of program points at which it is live. So, in this example here, here and here this is these are the three places where the variable a is live. So, these three form the live, ra uh, live range of a and the, these three form the live range of uh, b. So, let us look at a simple algorithm for uh, global register location. The uh, region here is not a complete function, but uh, we will look at loops. So, to begin with we will see how to do allocation for single loops and then apply the same algorithm for uh, multiple loops as well. So, this algorithm can be used to allocate registers for variables used within loops and it requires information about the liveness of variables at the entry and exit of each basic block. Why do we require this information? The loop is somewhere in the middle of uh, a program. So, if there are variables which are live on entry to the basic block that is the variables are used within the uh, loop okay. and uh, this can be brought down to the level of the basic block. So, if the variable is live at the beginning of a basic block then you know it is used within the basic block. So, okay. And if the variable is live at the exit of the basic block then it is used beyond the basic block. So, if this is the uh, way it is. So, if the variable is live at the entry of a basic block then we must load that uh, variable into a register at the entry and if it is live at the exit of the basic block then we must store the variable into memory at the end of the basic block. So, to make sure that uh, the costs of doing these operations is actually computed properly we require this live, in, live information. And uh, why are we not bothered about the variable uh, you know uh, as throughout the uh, program once it is computed uh, into a register then obviously, it stays in that register till the end of the basic block. So, uh, we are only interested uh, in the variable computation the first time the rest of the time anyway it stays in the register. So, there is no extra saving that is possible. So, we are not interested in the usages of variables after the first uh, computation is kind of uh, over. So, then the load store instructions also cost 2 units. So, because they uh, occupy 2 words this is the assumption in computing the savings when we compute what is known as a usage count. So, let us understand how to compute the usage count. So, there are 2 components here. So, the first one says for every usage of a variable v in a basic block until it is first defined. As I said once it is defined we are not bothered because it stays in the register. So, until it is first defined we will say if it is assigned to a register then you know we save something. So, savings v is equal to savings v plus 1 and after v is defined it stays in the register. So, we do not have to worry about the uh, there is nothing extra saving possible. So, this is one part of the saving that uh, use or rather the usage count. Then there is another part for every variable v computed in the basic block if it is live on exit uh, basic block then count a savings of 2 since it, is, since it is not necessary to store it at the end of the basic block. So, the point is if we assign a register to this variable uh, you know which is live on exit then that means you know it stays in that register and uh, we really do not have to store it that is the basic idea otherwise we would have uh, really stored it at the end of the basic block. Then with these 2 components we are going to have the savings as sigma over all the basic blocks in the loop savings of uh, the variable v in the basic block plus 2 star a factor called live and computed v comma b. So, this is basically uh, you know the variable being uh, computed uh, this is either 1 or 0. So, this 2 star live and computed corresponds to this part. 
So, the variable v computed in the basic block if it is live on exit. So, whereas, the first one corresponds to this part. So, we do that you know and there is a minor factor which we ignore. So, to the on the entry and exit uh, of the loop the points of entry and exit of the loop we have to load or store a live variable. For this we require uh, two units for the load or two units for the store at the exit, but these are one time cost because uh, this is actually required only at the entry of the loop or entry of uh, exit of the loop. We are not talking about the entry and exit to the basic block that has been taken care of here. Once we compute the total savings the variables whose savings are the highest will reside in registers. So, let us look at an example a very simple basic block the variables b c and f are live on entry to this loop and along this path a c d f uh, uh, you know uh, variables are being used. So, a c d and f are uh, live at this point a c d and e are live at this point c d and f are live at this point b c f are live here and of course, exiting from the loop a b c d e f are live here. So, it is easy to check why uh, you know liveness is like this a c d f are being used here see a c d and f all the four are being used that is why it is all these four are live. So, let us compute the uh, usage count it has been listed for each of the variables here. So, let us take the variable a and again the cost has been listed for each of the basic blocks. For the basic block B 1 the cost is 0 plus 2 why the first component obviously, corresponds to usage before it is defined. So, A is directly defined here in the first statement itself. So, there is no usage before definition. So, the cost is 0 here and then A is indeed being computed in the basic block. Okay. And then uh, it is also uh, live on exit from the basic block. So, remember this. So, count uh, you know for every variable v computed in the basic block if it is live on exit from the basic block. So, it is indeed live a variable a along both the paths. So, we have uh, 1 uh, into uh, 2 into 1. Okay. So, that is the cost here. So, this is uh, 2. In the basic block B 2 we have a usage of A before any definition of A. So, that is cost 1 and we do not have a definition of A. So, the second factor becomes 0. Similarly, we have a usage of A in B 3. So, that costs uh, 1 and the second part is 0 because there is no definition of A here. So, in the fourth one there are there is neither a usage of A nor a computation of A. So, both the costs are 0 here. So, this total cost is 5 4. Similarly, for B we have three uses of the variable B uh, you know and uh, it is before any definition of B. In fact, there is no definition of B at all. So, the first cost is 3 and the second cost is 0. Here we do not have any uh, usage of B before its definition and B is not live on exit from the basic block. So, both the costs are 0 here. Similarly, the same is true for this there is no usage of B and B is not live. So, these are two zeros here and the fourth one V 4 the first component is 0 because there are no usages of B before its definition. B is uh, computed in the basic block and it is live on exit. So, the cost is uh, really 2. Okay. So, 2 into 1. So, this cost is 5. Similarly, we can compute the costs of C, D, E and F as well. Now, 5 goes uh, undisputed and that will be one of the variables uh, to which a register can be given. Then there are uh, 3 contenders A, D and F 2 out of these can be given registers we have arbitrarily picked A and D 
it really does not matter which is uh, given here. Okay. It could have been A and F as well. So, once we provide registers to these variables, the code will also become different. When we may generate the machine code, we will have to make sure that uh, we refer to the register corresponding to A, B and D. Okay. And we must make sure that uh, of course, A is not live here, but uh, B is. So, B will have to be loaded on entry to the loop and uh, A and B will have to be A, B and F will have to be put back into memory by using store instructions at the exit of the loop. So, these are all things that will have to be done using the register corresponding to the three variables. So, what happens if uh, we have uh, nested loops? So, let me uh, tell you, uh, uh, you know, using this example. So, here is the a small loop L2, which is actually, so here is the loop okay, L2 and it is embedded within the loop L1. Okay. So, there are some basic blocks here and here as well. So, how do we now allocate uh, registers to the nested loops? So, the procedure is to assign registers for the inner loops first and then consider the outer loop. So, we have L 1 nesting uh, within the loop uh, you know L 2. So, yet uh, sorry let L 1 nest L 2. So, L 2 is being nested inside the loop L 1. So, that is what uh, this means. The rule is for the variables assigned registers in L 2, but not in L 1 load these variables on entry to L 2 and uh, store them on exit from L 2. So, let us see what this means here. So, let us say variables x, y and z are assigned registers here. So, we did the register allocation. So, they got the registers here, but when we did the register location for L 1 they did not get any registers. So, variables uh, should get registers only here not uh, in these two places. So, what we need to do is uh, very obvious we need to load x, y and z on entry to this loop L 2 and then uh, we need to store uh, x, y and z on exit from the loop. So, once this is uh, accomplished you know uh, that is it there is no we have to take care of these costs and uh, that particular allocation will work properly. Case 2 a, B and C are assigned registers in L 1, but they are not assigned any registers in L 2. So, in such a case you know uh, when we actually enter the loop L 2, because the registers corresponding to A, B and C will be given to some other variables, we need to store their values in a memory. And then when we exit the loop L 2, we need to put the values from the memory into the registers again for corresponding to the variables a b and c. So, if this be this if this is done then the loop will pro work properly. Then the variables p q are assigned registers in both L 1 and L 2 obviously, we do not require any special action at all you know they just continue from one loop to another. So, this is the usage count uh, algorithm where usage count based algorithm for allocating registers to uh, you know variables. So, now let us look at a very fast register allocation scheme. This is called as uh, linear scan register allocation. So, the reason now it is called linear scan will become clear very soon. This is due to uh, you know Poletto and Sarkar and it was actually published in 1999. It uses the notion of what is known as a live interval rather than a live range. So, live interval is an approximation uh, to a live range. So, in other words uh, live ranges are subsets of uh, live intervals. It is relevant for applications where compile time is important. So, for example, in dynamic compilation and just in time compilation the compilation time is also added to runtime because all the compilation happens on the fly. 
in such cases using a very expensive uh, register locator uh, you know is uh, going to uh, have a bad effect on the compiler. So, we must use simple register locators. So, this particular linear scan register locator is something that can be used in dynamic and just in time compilers. Uh, register location schemes which uh, are based on graph coloring are very slow. So, they cannot be used in JIT and uh, dynamic compilers. Okay. So, let us begin uh, with uh, a definition for the live interval. Assume that there is some numbering of the instructions in the intermediate form. Okay. Now, an interval i comma j is a live interval for a variable v if there is no instruction with number j prime greater than j such that v is live at j prime. Similarly, there is no instruction you know with number i prime less than i such that v is live at i. So, let me show you an example here. So, we have the i and j here this is the uh, you know sequence of instructions that we are considering for the variable v to be live. So, if we take another instruction i prime you know then we any of the instructions before this will not have v as live okay. such an i prime where v is live does not exist. Similarly, this is the last instruction where v is live. So, any other instruction j prime where v is live does not exist. Okay. So, in if this are satisfied these two conditions are satisfied we say that uh, i to j is the live interval for the variable v. So, this is a conservative approximation of live ranges. So, there may be sub ranges of uh, i comma j where we live, but uh, these are ignored. So, in other words if this uh, you know sequence from i to j is a long sequence it is possible that we define you know the variable uh, many times within this uh, range, but all such ranges of the same variable are included in the live interval from i to j. So, here is uh, an example to show you that. So, obviously, here is uh, the definition of A, here is another definition of A, here is the usage of A, here is the usage of B. But if you look at the uh, text sequence for the uh, instructions, the definition of A comes first, then the definition of uh, B, which is actually in the basic block, this basic block then we have the condition corresponding to this basic block, then we have the usage of A and then the usage of B. So, these instructions will be numbered in some order, we are going to take the instruction number from this assignment to A and the instruction number where A has been used last. So, this entire range of instructions which includes the basic block B will be considered as the live interval for A. So, even though A is not defined or not used uh, you know A is not used here at all. So, A is not live here, but we are since we are going to look at the text placement. So, from A to A this your definition of A to usage of A is going to be uh, considered as the live interval for A. So, given an order for uh, pseudo instructions and live variable information live intervals can be very easily computed using just one pass over the intermediate representation. So, let me tell you how it can be done. So, we start scanning the instructions uh, one by one. Okay. So, we hit a definition for a let us some variable v let us say then we go on looking at uh, you know other definitions and variables uh, usages of uh, the variable v. So, once we know that the last usage of v has been met then you know the entire range i to j is taken as the live uh, interval for variable v. 
interference among live intervals is assumed if they have an overlap. So, okay. So, uh, these are you know the live intervals are nothing but uh, intervals of integer numbers. So, if there are two intervals which overlap then you know they have some common range between them. So, that is the basic idea. So, the number of uh, overlapping intervals changes only at the start and end points of an interval this becomes very clear as we take an example. So, let me show you that example here before we continue with the algorithm. So, there are many live ranges live intervals here i 1, i 2, i 3, i 4, i 5, i 6, i 7, i 8, i 9, i 10, i 11 right. Now, uh, we say that you know uh, so the variable some variable is actually uh, live throughout this interval. So, please observe that uh, we are going to make a decision about uh, register location at the start and end points of uh, these intervals. Okay. So, the basically uh, we are going to consider some uh, information here and then the next uh, next point at which we consider it is here. So, at these points we are going to check whether uh, some intervals are have expired and so on and so forth. So, the number of uh, overlapping intervals uh, changes only at the start and end points of uh, an interval. So, this is uh, how we uh, you know look at the intervals. So, to do that live intervals are stored in the sorted order of uh, increasing start point. So, here so the start point uh, of i 1 is the first one then we have i 5 then we have i 8 then we have i 2 then we have i 9 i 6 you know then we have i 3 then i 10 i 7 i 4 and i 1. So, this is the sorted order of the intervals at each point in the program the algorithm also maintains what is known as uh, an active list. So, the active list of live intervals uh, correspond to the intervals which are overlapping the current point and of course, very important these are the intervals which have been placed in registers. So, the intervals uh, which are active, but have not been placed in registers actually are the ones which have been assigned to memory locations. So, they will not occur in this particular list we will see how this happens. So, this active list is kept in the sorted order of the increasing end point. Remember live interval list is stored uh, sorted according to the starting point and the active list is stored uh, uh, you know in the sorted order of the increasing end point. So, this is the uh, you know active list at, these are the active list at various points a b c and d. So, at a i 1 you know is the only one which has which is active and it let us say it has been given a register. At point b we have uh, i 5 and i 1 both of them actually overlapping and uh, let us assuming that they will be given registers they are the they will both be in the active list of b. At the point c i 1 has finished. So, it will not be in the active list anymore, but i 5 and i 8 will be. So, assuming that they are given registers they will be in the active list. If so, at d here right. So, we have uh, i 7 which has not finished yet i 4 which has not finished yet and i 11. Okay. So, this is uh, so this is kept sorted in um, according to the end point. So, this finishes first then this finishes and then this finishes. So, if sub for example, uh, uh, you know i 7 has never been given a register then uh, i 7 will not be in the list even though it is overlapping with i 4 and i 11. Okay. It would have been assigned to memory. So, the active list at this point hypothetically will contain only i 4 and i 11. So, in uh, you know how does the algorithm work. So, let me show you an example and then we will read through the um, algorithm detail. Okay. So, what we do is uh, we have this sorted uh, order of intervals. So, this is according to the starting point. 
So, we take the first item on the list. So, which is I 1 we have three registers that is the that is let us say that is the assumption. So, we give one register to I 1. So, we are left with uh, two more. The next uh, uh, list you know uh, uh, the next interval in the list is I 5. So, at this point we check whether uh, I 1 has finished it has not finished yet. So, we add uh, I 5 to you know we check the number of registers. So, two more are remaining. So, we can give 1 to I 5 as well. So, I 1 and I 5 are now in the active list. Let us go to point uh, C that is the next one I 8 is the next interval in the list. So, we consider I 8 and the starting point of I 8 is C. So, at this point we can check uh, from the active list uh, that I 1 which is present in the active list and has been given a register has completed okay, okay, it is not active anymore. So, it can be removed from the active list and uh, its register can be returned to the free pool. So, at this, this was the list. So, we removed I 1. So, I 1 is still active. Now, we add I 8 to this list. Okay. Now, uh, we can add it because we have two registers and we can give 1 to I 8. Next, we take up I 2 right. At this point neither I 5 nor I 8 have finished and we have three registers the third one being free we can give it to I 2 and these three will actually be the uh, on the I uh, active list at this point. So, after I 2 we consider I 9. So, when we consider I 9 we find that uh, both I 5 and I 8 have finished. Okay. So, I 2 and I 9 will be on the active list and of course, uh, they can be given registers. Then after I 9 we pick up I 6. So, at this point again um, I 2 and I 9 are both active I 6 can be added to the list and it can be given a register which is still available as a free register. When we go to I 3 you know so the uh, I 2 has finished but I 6 and I 9 are still active and uh, the third register is still free for I 3. Then we go to I 10 I 9 has finished, but I 3 and I 6 are active I 10 can be given the register which was freed by I 9. After I 9 we go to I 7. So, here you know I 6 has finished, but 3 and 10 have not finished and the register which was freed by I 6 can be given to I 7. Then we go to I 4, I 3 has finished, I 10 has finished, only I 7 is active. So, two registers are free, one can be given to I 4. And at I 11, we need all the three registers because I 7 and I 4 have not yet finished. So, this is the way in which uh, register allocation can be done for this simple example. So, now let us look at uh, another example. Uh, in which there is uh, some uh, shortage of registers. So, we have A, B, C, D and E as uh, 5 live intervals and let us assume that there are 2 registers available. So, what we do here is you know we begin with A right. So, this is the starting point of uh, A this is point number 1. So, we can give a register to A absolutely no problem with that. Then we have uh, uh, you know the live interval of B this is the point and at B A is still active and we have one more register which is free. So, we can give that to B no problem so far. So, A and B are now on the active list. So, we go to C. So, A and B are still live you know they are overlapping they have not finished and uh, the two registers are already you know have been given to A and B. Now, we come to C. The question to be asked is should we take away a register from either A or B and give it to C or just make C uh, go to memory that is called as spilling. 
So, in this case the decision is made by looking at the end point of the three uh, intervals which are active at this point. So, C actually has an end point which is much farther than that of A or B. So, what we do is uh, we the heuristic says spill C and put it in memory. The reason behind this heuristic is very simple because C takes uh, a lot of time you know by that time may be if we put it in memory A and B uh, may free their registers and uh, we will be able to assign more variables to the registers rather we can probably give uh, more number of variables the a register. Okay. So, that is the hope and therefore, larger uh, uh, you know time intervals or rather live intervals are assigned to memory by the spilling operation. So, C is given actually put into memory and then at point 4 A expires right. So, A has finished that can be made sure of by looking at the uh, end point of A. So, it does not have any overlap with that of T, but B is still active C is not in the picture because it has been assigned to memory. So, now we can uh, A, A has released a register and that can be given to D. Then we go to the starting point of E at this point B has finished that register can be given to E D has not yet finished. So, in this example we have actually sent C to memory spilled it into memory. So, what will have what would have happened if the duration of C was uh, much smaller. So, for example, here 1, 2 and 3 are similar okay. uh, as rather 1 and 2 are similar at this point of beginning the live interval C we find that uh, B's live interval stretches beyond that of uh, either A or B. So, the candidate which is to be spilled is B and it is neither A nor C. So, what we do is uh, we take away the register which was given to B, we now give it to C, A retains its register because we had two registers this is fine. So, spill B since end point of B was greater than end point of C, give register to C. Now, onwards everything is still ok because at the point D A frees a register and that can be given to D. At the beginning of E C has finished and therefore, its registers can be given to E. So, this is the algorithm. So, now let us look at the formal description of the algorithm to understand how uh, it goes. So, the active list is to begin with made empty and uh, for each live interval i in the order of uh, increasing start point we uh, execute the following code. The first is uh, expire old intervals. So, all the intervals which have exceeded the you know rather have completed their uh, uh, time interval are now thrown away I will will I will give you uh, details of this very soon. Then whatever exists in the active list is only uh, the list of uh, intervals which are still uh, you know which have not expired okay. and they have all been given registers. So, if the length of the active list is r then you know we must call spill at interval i and uh, this may decide to give the uh, you know uh, put a register into uh, with put a variable which actually has a register into memory or it can actually store the new interval itself in memory. We will see the details of this also very soon. If the register is free that means, the length of active is not equal to r. So, it is much lesser than r. So, there is one at least one register free. So, then we can assign that register to the uh, register you know the, uh, the we can actually assign the uh, live interval i uh, this particular register removed from the pool of free registers. So, now add i to the active list sort it again by the increasing end point. So, that uh, 
you know we are ready for the next iteration. So, and we still need to see the details of the two uh, uh, functions expire old intervals and spill at interval i. So, how do you expire old intervals? We are going to inspect every interval j in the active list. So, we look at the increasing endpoints of this because it is already sorted in that order. So, the remember the uh, interval i is the new interval ok, j corresponds to the older ones in the active list. So, if the end point of j is greater than or equal to start point of i that means, j is still active ok, then continue. So, we do not do anything we go to the next uh, interval. If the end point of j is less than the starting point of i that means, uh, j has completed so, remove j from active, add register j to the pool of free registers. So, this is done for all the intervals in the active list. So, wh whichever has retired will be uh, you know removed from the list and those registers will be given to uh, will be added to the pool of free registers. Then the function spill at interval. So, again i is the uh, new interval and we must decide whether i should be as given a register or we want to put i into memory. So, let spill be the last interval in the active list last ending interval. So, if the end point of spill is greater than or equal to the end point of uh, i. So, in other words uh, the last uh, interval in the active list ends much greater than much later than the in new interval i. Okay. Then we take away the register that was given to this interval spill and give it to the interval i. So, register i equal to register spill this is the taking away operation. And then the location of uh, spill will be new stack location. In other words, the interval spill is now banished to memory. So, this is the new location at variable uh, location which was created on the activation record. So, that is actually now taken and given to spill. So, these are the locations which are on the activation record. So, uh, uh, these are the offsets which will be assigned to the intervals or the variables. So, now remove the uh, interval spill from active. So, the variable corresponding to spill is now gone it is always going to be in memory. The new interval is uh, added to active list and we have already given it a register and then uh, the active list is adjusted to be in the sorted order of increasing endpoints. So, suppose the uh, none of the uh, intervals in the active list uh, actually have an uh, you know um, ending point which is greater than that of i. That means, i itself ends much later than any of the intervals in the active list. So, location of i is uh, new stack location. So, we banish i itself to the uh, memory. Okay. So, that is the way spill at interval works. So, these are the details of uh, the algorithm that has actually done here you know we took away the register which was actually uh, given to be and uh, we banished it to memory whereas, c was given a new register. Whereas, in the this example the incoming interval c had an endpoint which is much greater than these two. So, this was actually sent to the memory whereas, these two retained their registers. So, this is the uh, I know linear scan register location algorithm. Let us look at the complexity of the linear scan algorithm. Okay. So, as I said uh, the uh, scan uh, complexity of the linear scan is very important. Uh, the reason being it is used in dynamic uh, and uh, just in time compilers. So, suppose V is the number of live intervals and r 
is the number of available physical registers. Okay. Then uh, suppose we use a balanced binary tree for storing the active intervals. Obviously, every one of the accesses for either insertion, deletion or such can all be done in time log r. We have uh, v number of uh, live intervals to manage. So, the time complexity will be v into log r. Remember that the active list can be at most r long okay? and uh, that is why we are saying log r. Insertion and deletion are the important operations. We remove something from the active list, we add something to the active list. So, empirical results uh, which are reported in literature uh, typically our uh, you know uh, Sarkar's paper, uh, they indicate that linear scan is uh, much faster than graph coloring uh, algorithm and of course, there is always a price to pay for this uh, fast algorithm. The price is that the code run the machine code which is emitted is a bit slower. So, in the worst case it is about 10 percent slower than the gen code generated by an aggressive graph coloring based algorithm. So, graph coloring based algorithm is much better. So, that uh, uh, you know can enable more efficient code generation, but we are paying for uh, uh, you know the efficiency by the speed of the allocator and slow allocators cannot be used in dynamic and just in time compilers. So, now we move on to the next uh, class of algorithms for register allocation. So, we now uh, look at the graph coloring based algorithm. Okay. Way back in 80s uh, Chaitin from IBM and uh, a few others for the first time they proposed that uh, graph coloring can be used to solve the register allocation problem quite well. So, what is the association of a graph coloring algorithm uh, rather a formulation to the uh, program. So, nodes in the uh, you know we have a data structure called the interference graph I am going to give you details of the interference graph very soon. The, the for example, uh, to give you a uh, uh, you know first cut approximation, if you look at the uh, live ranges that we actually used uh, in uh, you know usage based algorithm and the live intervals that we used in our uh, linear scan algorithm, the live ranges actually are the nodes in the interference graph. Okay, and uh, the where there are also entities called webs which are possible. We are not getting into details of web based uh, register location in this lecture. So, now the nodes of the uh, interference graph correspond to live ranges. Whenever there are two live ranges which actually run through the program at the same time that means, they are active at the same time in the program same point in the program then they are set to actually interfere. So, an edge connects two live ranges that interfere or conflict with uh, one another. So, the conflict is very similar to that of live intervals you know if the ranges overlap then they conflict. Usually we require two types of uh, data structures one the adjacency matrix the other the adjacency list to represent such an interference graph. The reason is Sometimes we want to compute the number of uh, neighbors in the uh, for a node. Okay. So, in such a case uh, searching the adjacency matrix for the neighbors is very inefficient. Whereas, if we have an adjacency list then you know the uh, searching for the uh, neighbors is a very efficient uh, operation. Okay. We just search the list. Similarly, there are other operations which may be very efficient on the adjacency list whereas, uh, sorry adjacency matrix whereas, the adjacency list may be very expensive. So, both these uh, are used by the algorithm and the overhead uh, actually is uh, maintaining both the data structures instead of just one. 
So, the basic idea is to uh, you know take the graph and now the nodes of the graph correspond to live ranges. So, we assign colors to the nodes such that two nodes connected by an edge are not assigned the same color. So, this is the basic idea. So, the color corresponds to uh, a register. So, number of colors available is equal to the number of registers available on the machine. And then a k coloring of the interference graph is mapped on to an allocation with uh, k registers. Assuming that we have k registers, we try to use k colors. So, you know the difficulty is if the uh, you know uh, interference graph cannot be colored with uh, k colors, then uh, it implies that uh, with k registers we cannot do an optimal register location for the program. So, in such a case we will have to actually uh, you know uh, reduce uh, reduce the number of uh, nodes in the graph. So, we may have to remove some of the nodes by what is known as a spilling operation. So, we try to do the spilling operation on the nodes of the graph reduce the size of the graph and then uh, you know continue with the allocation. So, let me give you a very simple example here. This is an interference graph which is said to be true colorable. So, we have a green and violet two colors available here. So, green corresponds to one register and uh, this violet corresponds to another register. So, in this case this is said to be three colorable. So, we have three colors corresponding to three registers of the uh, machine. So, we have assigned a color here and the same color here, but it so happens that the two neighbors have two different colors. That means, the live ranges of this and this they are connected by an edge. So, that means, they are active at the two variables are active at the same time, but since they are in two different registers there is no problem in the program. The same uh, is actually valid here as well. So, the basic idea behind uh, Chaitin's algorithm is to choose an arbitrary node of degree less than k and then put it on a stack. So, remove that vertex and all its edges from the graph. So, uh, you know that means, this is the reduction of the graph this may decrease the degree of some other nodes and cause more nodes to have degree less than k. So, if you look at this suppose we uh, you know have not assigned any colors here we take this graph if we take this node we remove this ok. Then we remove the two edges also connected to it the graph which is left out is only this part ok and we continue that operation on this part of the graph. Whereas, if we try doing it here if we remove this node then these two just go away and what remains is uh, this graph. So, at some point if all the vertices have degree greater than or equal to k some node has to be spilled because uh, we cannot continue this coloring uh, operation which we described here you know rather uh, we cannot continue this redu reduction operation which we described here. If no vertex needs to be spilled that is the best part of it then successively pop vertices of the stack and color them in a color not is used by the neighbors reuse of colors is uh, definitely possible. So, for example, here you know we uh, let us say there are two registers we remove this right and then we are left with this graph then we can remove this node we are left with this graph we remove this node we are left with just one node graph we remove this as well then the graph is empty. So, in the reverse order we can assign colors which are available we give a color to this obviously, then this gets a different color then this can this is added next that gets a different color and finally, this is added and that gets a completely different color. So, this is uh, the way Chaitin's algorithm would uh, proceed. So, I will stop here now and consider the details of the Chaitin's algorithm in the next part of the lecture. Thank you.